Hello, everyone, to the latest in the series of our CAEA um, uh, e-learning seminars. Uh, today's topic is building better boundary conditions. Uh, this will be a 30-minute presentation. Uh, questions uh, can be asked through the chat window that will be answered uh, primarily at the end, but there may be some in the middle that may be of interest. If you're interested in getting uh, professional engineering credits, please be sure to fill in the uh, poll and also send the surveys at the end of the session. They are, are do we full advantage of all the different boundary conditions available to us in terms of building our model, supplying our different connection supports, and understand the ramifications of those supports and connections. So a little bit about evaluating boundary conditions, provide some simple examples. Including those boundary conditions, we'll be utilizing uh, boundary conditions such as remote supports, anti-symmetry, periodic cyclic symmetry, some features that have recently been added in terms of capabilities of applying nodal displacements or nodal boundary conditions where the region of load does not have to align itself with the geometry, and some advanced connection features in particular some of the capabilities in terms of defining joints in your model. So as a demonstration, as an example, what we'll put together is just take a simple beam. And when this is a beam uh, resting on a couple columns. And interesting that when I first started doing final elements some 30 years ago, this was the first problem given to me was here, create a final element model and give me results that match beam theory. And years later, we're still uh, an issue in terms of being correct and adequate boundary conditions to solve a particular problem of interest. There's many different ways, of course, to model the condition of a beam sitting on a couple columns. And what I want to go over is some different techniques and see the ramifications of the different methods and different boundary conditions that can be employed. So this method we can employ to define this is to simply build the actual beam. In this case, the beam only where the column constraints are good from the model, and we have two different support conditions. In the beam model, um, the fine element uh, branch, there's a fixed support defined where we fix the entire end of the beam a frame of support and then a the vertical constraint is only applied on the end of the model. For the only model, we're applying a fixed constraint at both ends of the beam and then a pin constraint on both ends. And we can symmetry and model half the beam, of course, uh, as needed. Pair the ramifications of these two different modeling techniques, we expose something that's of interest to every user is, do my boundary conditions, are they influencing my results? Condition of stress results, the stress is at the edge of the beam where you have a fixed constraint, uh, creates a singularity. So those stresses in the brick model are not and stresses that we would use in any kind of design ramifications. They're really just for reference-only condition. And notice, for the two different conditions, as I refine the mesh, the stress increases, uh, also exemplifying the fact that it's a singularity. For a beam-only model, I can model the fixed constraint and the pin constraint, and these two boundary conditions typically will bound the solution of any type of result or any type of modeling simulation. For the B only model, my minimum displacement for the fixed condition is 0.29, which is similar to what I'm getting for the brick model. And then if I use a pin pin connection, I get significantly more displacement, 0.1, point essentially uh, inches of displacement. So it gives me two bounding solutions, but this might necessarily and probably isn't going to be accurate enough for what I need for my particular design evaluation. So to increase the accuracy, I do extend, or one of the ways to increase is extend the model a little out farther out into the actual physical geometry. 
And one of the options for doing that is using what's called a remote point. And as part of that remote point, I can put a remote connection. So I'm going to tie, and this is the top of the column theme, but I can actually model this in depth in five elements at this point, but I'm simply going to make a connection between the two and use the remote point feature. And as the remote port feature in terms of defining this, I have several different options in terms of how I can characterize the behavior between the surface at the top of the column and the connection point, which is where I am assuming that there's some kind of rigid support that I call it. Maybe it's uh, attached to ground, for instance. I see in the remote point pull is that we have four different options. We have a rigid deformable beta a beam connection and a so-called coupled connection. Understanding of the differences of these two different these methods in terms of applying this type of constraint, we notice that for the rigid connection, uh, the connection and the geometry will stay constant at the top of the column. For if we have a force-based condition, we get that formation that could occur at the top of the column. So the column surface is no longer rigid. And this is demonstrated in these images showing that the deformed or force-based constraint allows for local deformation. The rigid constraint is the original geometry. The cup constraint would allow us to determine which particular degrees of freedom we want to transfer this load from the point to the surface. That it turns out that internally what ANSYS will do is create a whole series of linked beam elements, and these beam elements are connected between the nodes at the top of the column to the support condition, and the cross-sectional area of these beams is set equal to approximately the nodal surface area for our particular model that we're analyzing. Take now and compare the results in terms of now we're looking at going to look at just the mid-span stress results to get away from the singularity at the column beam connection and compare results with the only model, whether the beam only model is modeled with brick elements or modeled with beam elements, and compare that with the remote point. And the remote point gives us more flexibility. The displacements increase um, from from 0.03 to 0.04, and variation between the stiffness characterization, you know, the most flexible connection of these is remote beam option. We now have some flexibility defined between our fixed constraint and the top of our column. Also, look at this particular example and the obs in terms of looking at the how set up up within the AMS workbench environment. So we would insert a remote point into a project tree. And the details pane of the remote point, we can select the particular surfaces that we want to be connected, and we can also select the behavior of how we're going to connect this option. We'll use the rigid, deformable, coupled. And also, if we choose, we can specify or isolate manually which particular degrees of freedom we want active in that particular connection. So the point gives us a more accurate solution, but it, we're still not really characterizing the stiffness of the column explicitly. So this point, the next level of facility in terms of increasing the accuracy of our solution, will be good and model the column explicitly. Computational effort, we may not necessarily want to model the entire column section. So, what I've shown here at demonstrating is we can take the column and split it into two components. The upper portion of the column where it connects to the beam is modeled explicitly with detailed finite elements, and the lower portion of the column is modeled with beam elements. We simplify the computational effort, and on the interface, we can tie those two surfaces together using a contact where we're going to use a vertex to target type contact, a bonded condition, where now we're going to use the MPC option, which is going to write constraint equations to take the rotational 
degrees of freedom on the top of the beam and translate that stiffness across to the translational degrees of freedom at the top of the column. Continuous displacement response uh, and through the column, so we're representing the true stiffness of the column itself. What you can do now there can be a connection between the top of the column and the beam. For this example, I looked at two different scenarios. The first scenario says, what if I simply totally bond the top of the column to the beam? A scenario was what if I take the beam and assume it's just resting on the column, but it's a frictionless support, so it's just a beam sitting on the column. To compare and contrast the analysis results for these two scenarios, you notice that for the option of the bonded connection, the displacement response and stress response, it's a little estimated, but it's a reasonable approximation to scenario would be this remote point with the beam feature. The scenario of a frictionless connection between the top of my column and the support. And, you know, it's more of analogous to just a pinned beam scenario. So my pinned beam model actually fairly accurately represents the mid-span axial stress and mid-span displacements that occur with this kind of modeling assumption. Assumption. Look at the modeling setup for this particular scenario. The actual mechanical setup. So under our contacts, we can specify a bonded connection. The bonded connection can be defined between the vertex of the beam element and the faces of the column become the target. And then we're using a bonded contact, and in the formulation here, using the MPC formulation, we can use this option, translate the rotational degrees of freedom that are going to be coupled between the rotational degrees of freedom at the top of the beam to the translational degrees of freedom at the base of the column section model. of insight in a simple example, but help to illustrate some methods that may be incorporated to make your conditions to understand and interpret the results of them, and maybe potentially may improve the results of your analysis. So what next is talk about symmetry, but before I get into the details of symmetry, I'm going to open the first poll and just get an idea of what people use in terms of symmetry in their particular analysis. So looking at reflective symmetry, anti-symmetry, which is illustrated on the slide, cyclic symmetry, and periodic symmetry. So a couple minutes for people to fill in the poll. And then, of course, what's of interest of these is you can see what your colleagues uh, answered in terms of what types of boundary conditions that they typically use most often for symmetry type conditions. A couple more seconds. Uh, the example here shown here is showing that the symmetric condition, which is used by a lot of people, and then the anti-symmetric condition, which may not be used as often. Uh, one of the things to be careful about is the symmetric boundary condition works whether we're doing a linear or nonlinear analysis, whereas the anti-symmetric boundary condition, strictly speaking, is only for principles of superposition. It really applies to the small deflection type problems, but we can have, of course, potentially uh, conditions even with uh, material and large deflection geometry and higher order kind of issues where the anti-symmetry boundary can be a reasonable approximation. Go ahead and close the poll time, and then I'll show the poll results to everybody. And basically, it's split between people using reflective symmetry and cyclic symmetry. Go ahead and save my results real quick. Let's bring it to the reflective symmetry, and what we're going to cover here, and we'll go through the various different types of symmetry boundary conditions that we can apply. Boundary condition may be something that most people are already aware of, but symmetry 
symmetry and the superposition of symmetry and anti-symmetry is something that can be useful for certain types of problems. So we took the example here. Where the problem we're trying to solve is a, comp a condition where the loading condition is asymmetric type loading, where I'm just putting pressure load on one side of my beam. Rotational expense, I can get away with only modeling half the beam column connection and still be able to represent this non-symmetric loading by using principles of superposition and using a combination of symmetric and anti-symmetric boundary conditions. In the example here, I modeled the entire beam column connection with this eccentric load. So we'll go through and model only one half and apply the appropriate boundary conditions. So, for example, I can set up a mechanical session where I specify my boundary conditions being a pressure load on the surface of my beam, a symmetry boundary condition where I'm only constraining in the direction of the axial component, or anti-symmetry boundary condition where displacement constraints are the two in-plane directions. Combine these results using a design and assessment tool. So we can drop the design and assessment tool on top of these mechanical setup. And in the design assessment tool, we can then define scaling factors for scribing my superposition. If I take the example model here, I have set up a model, a single model with, with symmetry boundary conditions. In this case, I'm modeling a symmetry plane. Uh, if on this only off modeling half the beam uh, in its the horizontal dimension. I have the various conditions and the beam connection and contact connections between, in this case, a bonded connection between the beam and the column. For the scribe boundary conditions now, I can set up the boundary conditions as a displacement condition in the solution. And the reason I did that is because now I can have only over one tree have the anti-symmetric results, same multiple, multiple system mechanical project. I can also have the symmetric boundary condition where I'm only constraining normal to the surface, and I have the symmetric response with the inserted design assessment tool on my project page where I have design assessment that was tagged and dropped on top of the two static structurals and within my tree structure I can actually define prescribe a load combination and if I'm just going to use superposition of these two static loads I can simply just say I'm going to use a static loading on these two cases with a 0.5 multiplier to get the effects of the combined results. And when I plot results, now I have results of the combined symmetric plus anti-symmetric solution. And symmetry we can look at. We can look at periodic symmetry. Uh, they can be periodic in terms of along a line, or they can be periodic in terms of cyclic symmetry. Cyclic symmetry, I won't get into too much detail here because we could do an entire session on cyclic symmetry and the various different options of that if that's of interest in the future. So if I on periodic symmetry, and this is a new feature added in 14.5, and I say I have a circuit board and a repetitive pattern in terms of the circuits, the chips and uh, isolators on this board, and not only the entire board, and I have some kind of boundary conditions and constraints, but if I have a, a repetitive symmetric structure, and those also repetitive symmetric, for instance, in this case, a lateral acceleration load, that you notice in my analysis of the full structure, not exactly periodic, but very close to being periodic is the results of the analysis of the full structure. As a simplification, as something I can do design studies on, but analyzing the full circuit board, I'm going to take out the smallest repeatable segment. So now 
analytical model is significantly smaller. And I can add two different boundary conditions where I can use a symmetry boundary condition along the center symmetry plane. And then a another symmetry condition, which would be a linear periodic symmetry condition to define coupling equations that would tie the two front and back face of my circuit board. I also need to specify the shift or what's the delta dimension between there, which will automatically create the appropriate coupling equations. And now I can run this analysis totally independent as a local model, but representing the full structure, assuming a periodic symmetric response. And if I the, in the post process, I can expand the solution so that I show that I'm in this periodic response and things make physical sense in terms of prescribing the periodic back conditions correctly. If I get nominal stress results in the board itself, I see very, very good comparison between the periodic model and the full circuit board example. Example of periodic symmetry is cyclic symmetry. Cyclic symmetry, I'm going to cut out the smallest repeatable segment. This segment is going to be a ratio of 360, so it's going to be a portion of my entire model. I apply a high and low boundary conditions for now. In this case, if it's a multi-cyclic symmetry, ANSYS will build constraint equations between the lower and higher face of the real part and lower and higher face of the imaginary part. Analysis phase, I can specify which particular harmonic index I want ANSYS to calculate. That's just showing an example of setting up a model for the harmonic response of setting up a model for a cyclic symmetry. The condition I want to talk about is a condition where I want to prescribe either loads or constraints, but I necessarily have geometry that matches is up with the group of loads I want to apply this load to. And this, I use a condition in mechanical, which is called nodal-based constraints. You can set up name selections based on really a series of selections or isolations of a loads in your model. These are analogous to running, for those that are, you use a, a mechanical APD or ANSYS Classic on a regular basis, analogous to a series of node select uh, commands, where we can select from the full group and then we can take a filter or take subsets of a group of nodes that we've created. And I've got examples here showing where I can isolate local sets of nodes. These options can be set up such that they're in your mechanical outline tree, such that if I make changes to geometry, loads, etc., they automatically, any changes will update. So I can run these in parametric studies or design optimization operations. This is an example just showing, demonstrating that I've applied that pressure load to that pattern. If I look at the stress normal to that particular area, I match the 1,000 PSI pressure that I define. I'm going to pull up my particular example for this operation. So example here where we can go ahead and specify as part of our loading condition name selection where we can set specify name selection and we can specify a filter operation that selects the nodes based on a local coordinate system based on the global coordinate system in this case. I'm going to change these so I can change which particular groups. In this case, I'm filtering and isolating the nodes in the bottom four inch by four inch base of the end of my beam. If I change this to an eight by eight segment and they generate, it dates the section process automatically so they have a larger section of constrained nodes. Go through and simply resolve my beam now with these updated conditions. So now I'm going to get the results of the cantilever beam with the full 8 by 8 support. Here's the condition where my pressure load was applied here. My constraint is down there. And I can look at the reaction force, for example, being balanced 
I can look at the stresses conditions. Now, another new feature that's been added, um, this one in 14.5, is the option that oftentimes I don't necessarily want to look at the reactions at the connections, but sometimes want to be able to take a force balance anywhere in the interior of my model. To provide that functionality, we can now use the options under the construction geometry create a surface body, so a surface in the surface geometry tool, and I can use this surface as part of my post-processing. So in processing, I can specify a force reaction. In this case, now my force reaction can be based on a method of the surface net, so I can use it from the surface I'm defining with construction geometry. And so in this particular section, I can orient based on the section cut, so I can prescribe and calculate what the net reaction force or what the next force is at this section, and also take at this section and calculate the moment reaction. So I can take, in this case, it would be different moment reactions through the section and specify the convention in terms of whether it's looking at the net moment based on the positive or negative side relative to my beam relative to this cut section. So a couple options in terms of setting up our nodal constraints and uh, post-processing them. The topic of uh, today's web is going to be looking at some examples in terms of various different advanced connections. So if you look at the connection tree, there's a series of different options in addition to contact. We can set up various different types of joints and springs and beams in our model. If we look at joint and isolate that and look at that a little further, we see that under joint, there's a series of different joint connections that we can create. And these could be between two bodies, or they can be between your body and ground. And if I have these different variations, they can include different things from slot to uh, spherical connections, etc. And most of these, what these are developing uh, underneath in the actual analytical model is a series of multi-point constraint elements. So the documentation on the MPC-184 and the various different operations of that can be used to get more information on the series of different capabilities. An example that I want to demonstrate as a representation of this, in this case, what I've done is put in a translational joint. And I hide the translational joint from to ground to, to solid and hide it to the end surface of my beam. And so what ANSYS does internally is creates a pilot node that ties this point to the surface and it connects the pilot node to an MPC-184 element. So this particular example, I used a translational method. So the highlighted in the translational ground is solved. The red is the act of degrees of freedom. So in this case, the act of degree of freedom is translation in the horizontal direction. And there's a bunch of different options that we have available to us. I'll go ahead and open the last poll, which is which boundary condition covered is something that you might see as a option that you may utilize in the future. And we'll get an idea of, of, of what everybody's answers are on that. So it's something we might use the remote, some of the remote features, uh, some of the joint connections, uh, or maybe the, the nodal based constraints that we just showed. more seconds to end the poll, um, but at this time I'd like to thank you for attending the latest in the series of CAE uh, uh, e-learning webinars, and uh, I know we have some exciting new topics coming up. Uh, one more seminar in terms of simplifying model generation, and then we're going to continue the series next year. Let's look at the close the poll and look at the uh, solution results, and we noticed that um, from the for most people, joints is actually of big interest and nodal based control. So those two features of, of interest and hopefully we'll try some of those out in the future. I want to thank you again and have a great rest of the day.